up, guys? What's happening? Welcome back to Creating Space, the podcast for the people. I'm so excited you're here. We're here in Wheelhouse Media Studio in the heart of Charlotte, and I'm joined by the real deal Shane Meal. What a name. Uh, and it comes with all of the confidence because guy's got a sprint car world record, 146.44 mile an hour average. He's driving life at 250 mile an hour, even with his new normal. Shane, Welcome to the podcast, man. I'm so excited to, to share with you on the, show, on the show. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to talk. I'm glad to share. I'm glad to spit some game. It's been a minute. Yeah, man. Listen, you know, a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, 2010 and beyond has been a bit different than before 2010, right? So for a listener who might not know much about Shane Meal to this date, Let's talk about the first 30 years of your life and what that sure. looked like, man. Let's let's start to build there. I hear, you know, as Adam is a great buddy of mine, mutual friends of ours, you've been running fast, man, since you were since you were walking. Um, so take us back to that first 30 years. What was that like for you? Well, the first 30 years of my life were uh, wide open, never slowed down for a thing. Um, I had uh, was just talking to somebody yesterday. I was a kid and wore my parents out for just uh, riding the lawnmower. They would, you know, let me ride it and just sit out there for hours and hours and ride a lawnmower at three years old, you know. Sure. Not that I should have been on it. And then I was racing go-karts at nine years old. I'd been riding motorcycles since I was three years old. Um, wide opens, well, it's just all I knew. My dad raced out of town all the time. Um, I had anything to do with motorsports, man. Right. My, my parents were cool about it. So you were, you've been born into this. Your dad was in motorsports and you just never had a sense of fear. Adam says even on the ice, you were fearless, man. You were running everything wide open. I just, uh, I just don't believe in fear. It's not gonna get you anywhere. There's, uh, there's, there's a sense of you don't need stupidity, but fear is just someone's common uh feeling and wow. you beat that common feeling then you, you you know it's just an action and um i out of all my wild things i broke my neck one time other than that i didn't do anything but a couple concussions really and being concussed is half funny anyway <laughs> being in the concussed state is half funny yeah it's a couple of days worth of good giggles and you know you feel like you're 17 and getting high again sure Talk to me about this. Talk to me about 17 years old. You're starting to get into this NASCAR chase. Yeah. It's very clear you want to get into the ranks of the Dale Juniors, right? The Jeff Gordons. You're looking yeah. at these guys and thinking, I'm every bit as good as, as them. 17 years old, what's life like as you're now getting into this race and chasing a NASCAR goal? It was something that was very fun. Uh, burned up a lot of time. But I would have uh, never been, uh, I would have never been able to experience what I got to experience in the racing side of life, the life side of life. Um, if I didn't start building my career, then it, it got, um, it started getting good at about 19 when people were starting to notice that I was winning and then, um, I, I really have good years every every decade, you know what I mean? Uh, 2000 was a big year for me in racing. I was just to turn 20, started winning every race. I'd set on like 13 straight poles, which was records. I won um, six races in a row. I think that that, that was made a record. Um, that was big and you know, that year I, I actually signed my Bush Series contract and got to go do some big time NASCAR racing. So that was a great year for me. I was 20 and uh, my 21 years old, man, I was racing big time, making $100,000 a year. I didn't know what I was doing. Wow. So let's hold there. I remember my rookie season in Vancouver mm -hmm. and man, I, I think back and enjoy you know, reminiscing on those memories and I can remember all of the memories, it seems vividly. What's that like when you're starting to see your, uh, your, your career unfolding, okay? And you've been waiting anxiously for it uh, and it's finally starting to happen. What was fueling you in that moment? 
Oh, man. At that moment, I really felt like I needed to prove something to people. Wow. You know, in the racing side of things, it's either you're scared, uh, you're not a guy that runs good on big tracks, you're just uh, someone that hangs it out too far. And um, I was the guy that was good on big tracks, good on fast tracks, uh, scared to hang, not scared to hang it out. But um, everybody knew that I would bump a fender up and, and tear a car up. But but they always knew I was going to pass the car in front of me no matter what. Right. And uh, that's that's just. That's Shane. There was no other way for you to drive, huh? So you earned that NASCAR sort of bad boy reputation really early. That was just who you were. Yeah, I I thought that uh, if the guy in front of you was slower than you and you give him so many laps and you you move him out of the way, you don't spin him out (laughs) or crash him, but you just, you move the car. And um, it's something that had to happen, I felt like, and... um, Some people got mad about it, but some people understood. What were they going to do? There wasn't a lot of fighting in NASCAR, and I grew up fighting my whole life, so it wouldn't have been anything. uh, I'm not saying that I'm some big, wild, tough guy, but um, racing and roughing people up was kind of my thing. Sure, I remember watching a couple of the documentaries. Some of the docs I've seen on you have been the most touching. I I mean, I don't cry often, not afraid to cry, but especially not in docs, but... The ones about your life have really touched me. Um, and I saw you, man, wild and getting in guys' faces, unafraid, energetic. Um, let's stick there for a second. Describe that bad boy. Um, if you can look back, it's obviously not who you are now. You're much more wise. You're much more contained in some circumstances. But describe that human. I was someone that uh, at that time nobody was going to Nobody was going to take any kind of um, advantage of me or nobody was going to rough me up or nobody was going to talk dirty about me and not feel my, you know, I had a presence that I wanted to carry about, you know. Sure. It was definitely bigger in my eyes than other people's eyes, but that's just how it is and how it was. That's commonly the case, yeah, isn't it? Um, just a, a, in this time of my life, I was going as fast as I could go. We were uh, fighting in the top five in, in the points in the Bush Series with a completely unsponsored team. Um, here, I'm 22 to 24 years old, and I'm doing good. I have cup teams, Winston Cup teams already calling me. Um, and I was just very um, loyal to the guy that gave me the first opportunity. So I just kept racing with him, kept racing with him, and uh, it always turned out for the good, man. I've sure. always been one of those people that if somebody's going to get the lucky deal, it's me. I love it. It's kind of a Conor McGregor-esque type uh, persona. If I could walk like that, I would do it. <laughs> yeah, I like I it, right? Do yeah. it. I it's would that do character it. that uh, that really drives his success, right? Uh, yeah. It also it sometimes could be a weakness for him. For sure. So let's talk about that, man. Going through um, what you've experienced now, there's some wisdom there. If you could look back at that 23, 24 year old Shane, and he's sitting here in this seat, what would you say to him in that moment? Um, to try to guide him through that time? Or was there anything that Shane could be told? Um, hmm. Was there anything I could be told? Not at that time did I need to be told stuff. Uh, Absolutely. At that time, I could have, um, I could have grown up. I could have still been rough and tough Shane. But I needed to play the real part, the professional part, the stand-up racer that I really was. Um, Not to lie, uh, I was great friends with Dale Jr. and I was wanting to be a Dale Jr. Dale Jr. was the bad guy. Sure. And he didn't even scuff anybody up. He was just Dale Jr., Dale Earnhardt's son. Right. So I tried to carry on that. 
uh, persona, however you say it. And um, it was something that at times I went too far. Got you it. know what I mean? And um, times I should have just be quiet, but I've never been quiet at the times I needed it. Sure. And that's just a part of who you are and always being true to yourself, which is something that I can admire. Right? I think a lot of people try to conform to what they think other people think they should be. And, you know, we were speaking with an individual this morning and she said, the gift of who you are is who you are. Right. And that's that's really good to hear. I've never heard that. But, you know, like you're saying, people can want you to look at a different way than you want to look. Correct. I never believed in that, didn't look at that that way. And 15 years later, I should have. So we'll get to regrets, if okay. any, at some point. But let's talk about this whole time in your life where drug policy starts to come in with NASCAR, mm -hmm. right? You fail a drug test, you come back, right? Um, look, talk, walk us through sort of that period in your life where some turmoil starts to come in all the success that you were experiencing. Well, I uh, had everything going my way. Like I was saying, we were in the top five in the points. Uh, I had smoked pot my whole life. Started when I was 13 years old. I wasn't the drinker. I had the fast car. Um, I would take all my buddies out drinking and I would go through the gears as they were chugging their beers and stuff like that. We yeah. just, I, but I was the one that drove you home. I got you home safe. I wasn't the drinker. Was I going to smoke pot? Yeah. And um, it was all, it, it was all that I did. It wasn't, I didn't wake up on the days I had to drive and smoke pot. I waited till after I drove and stuff like that. So um, it was something to me, it was like having a beer without having a beer. Sure. It was just my lifestyle. Right. Isn't that interesting how marijuana now has infused itself into the consciousness of humanity? And it, isn't it's, that? It's crazy. 15 years ago, uh, marijuana was something that. that could yep. actually kill people. That's right. And now they've got it to where it's, there's multiple states selling it, yeah. legalizing it, it's here, there, everywhere. So all of a sudden you fail the first drug test, right? And I'm imagining maybe NASCAR is gonna start to push you to the side and maybe quieten you a little bit because you, maybe you're tarnishing the image. What happens on the business side of things after the first drug policy fail? Well, on the business side of things, it was very hard to find sponsorship. Okay. Uh, companies weren't willing to invest money in someone that just failed a drug test six months ago. Got it. I was, um, I got a roadmap from NASCAR, which I totally lied about. I told them that I barely smoked pot, blah, blah, blah. So they didn't give me a lot of stuff to do um, because of what all I lied about. So I quickly beat that. I got back on my license and we were racing at Daytona. I failed my first drug test September 23rd, 2003. I was racing February 15th, wow. 04. So um, we were back in a car already. Uh, I still had people that were willing to spend money on me, but it was private money. It wasn't your uh, Rubbermaid or your Dewalt or Budweiser sure. wasn't coming to Shane Mill at that time. Um, but I still had a lot of privateers that would spend money. And um, that's the only way we made it. I come back in the truck series that year. That was the year that Toyota came into the truck series and really built it up. There was a lot of really good racers in it. And um, what a year it was. I experienced a lot of really cool things. Um, I won my first big NASCAR race that was in Las Vegas. Couldn't have been a better place to win, but I should have won five or six races. There was a lot of times I messed up. There was a lot of times my pit crew messed up. Um, it was a really good year. NASCAR was um, nothing but helpful for me. Sure. All they were doing was everything that they that, that, that was correct for someone that barely smoked pot, which is what I told them. Sure. Um, I, I was drug tested every race. Um, they would do it at the same time, I knew when it was going to happen. Um, I was already, I had switched over to cocaine at Got this it. time. I was uh, 
partying more than I needed to. I'd come home, party on Saturday night. That, that'd be the night I would party and wouldn't do another thing for the rest of the week. And uh, that's 2004. As we're coming back up on the 1st of 2005, I've got a lot going on in my life. I've got a sponsor that's actually coming. I've got cup teams that have sponsors that are starting to want me back. I'd already been a year now with, with passing drug tests, right. with doing everything NASCAR said. So people were starting to think, you know, hey, maybe Shane's got his head out of his, you know what, and right. got his shit together. And um, it, it, it was really cool. It was the first time that I'd had companies that wanted me. Uh, and I got lucky. I, was, I got picked up by a sponsor. And I don't know if anybody remembers Trim Spa. Anna Nicole was the main person. Yeah, no way. And yeah, it was super cool. And uh, we got to do a lot. I got to do a lot of cool things. I went to the Oscars. I drove up on the red carpet. No uh, way. Yeah, I had a date. Her name was Tracy Bingham. She was the... Uh, the black girl on Baywatch. Remember the tall girl? Oh, yeah, yeah, Tracy yeah. Bingham. That I was see my, you. That was my date. All right. I was doing big things. Real and, deal, Shane yeah, Bill. Yeah, I got, uh, that was all set up. Wasn't anything I did, I can uh -huh. tell you that. But there, there was, uh, I mean, I, I peed next to Lionel Richie. Thought that was pretty neat. Nice. Um, who, I went to a Leonardo DiCaprio party after that. Okay. He wasn't even at the party at his house, which I thought was kind of weird. Really? Yeah, wasn't even there because I was wanting to spook and, you know, see him, probably take a some kind of, uh, you know, picture, picture of yeah, some yeah. sort. Yeah, of course. Know, Paparazzi! <laughs> but, you know, so at this time, I, I've got a lot going on, but I'm using too much drugs. Got I'm, it. I'm doing the cocaine has switched over to way more than couple of days a month. Now we're doing it a couple of days a week. We're not, I don't have my head after the right Shane meal. I had it going good on the racetrack and that's it. Got on, it. The, on, the, on the dirt side of life, on the nasty side of life, I was living the bad one. So what happens next? Next, uh, we sit on some poles in the Bush Series. We sit on some top fives, threes, uh, top threes. Um, didn't win, had a chance to win a couple races, maybe. At least ran in the top three. And first week of June, pop a drug test on me. Uh, first Out of nowhere. So this is not... No. Had they gotten a tip, you think, that your lifestyle was getting out of control and, and they needed to... to to come in and test? I I could see that. Um, maybe um, there was rumors that uh, someone's wife that owned the race team had turned me in for saying I was uh, messed up at a Victory Junction game Got it. Uh, participation thing or something, which is not true. But um, I obviously, I went to bike week and uh, ended up doing some drugs. And uh, it wasn't even of my own. Uh, I went down there to not do anything and ended up doing some, but I got back and uh, I felt on a Friday, they, on a Friday at Charlotte Motor Speedway, they come over and they said, uh, we need drug test I said, no problem, let me go change. I took off and just run to my car. I you took to off car. running? Oh yeah, get in my driver's suit. I'm like, I need to change it. So I, I get the driver's suit and I drive my car all the way out, I go to the Concord Mills Mall and try to buy some stuff to clean my urine. Right. I'm in there in a driver's uniform, <laughs> race weekend, trying wow. to buy this stuff. So I'm looking like an idiot, but I had to do it. What, sure. what, what else was I going to do? And um, went back, drank it, sat around long enough, and uh, went back, took the test, and failed it. Failed it. Didn't wait long enough. But sure. But just part of it, I wasn't. It uh, the farther we get, all this comes around, and it's going to be in a circle that lets everybody understand the goodness. Well, what I love is how honest you are, right? It really builds the backstory and allows yeah. people to see the truth, right? Um, you gotta which, see it all. Yeah, absolutely. And I think more, and that's why I created this platform is yeah. that we could have real honest conversation. We could talk about life. I'm no stranger to mental illness. I've yeah. had my battles with it, and I know that. 
as you get the lifetime ban in NASCAR, if they, mm-hmm. as they move you out, I can't even imagine what you're going through as you start to experience your dream going away. Yeah, yeah you don't, I, I, I don't even notice it. I won't even let it be real. Mm. I wouldn't let it be real for the simple fact that I had just lost everything I had worked for. Um, it's kind of like Antonio Brown or, or, or just showing his ass completely. When you're watching him right you know now, it's a mean? great comparison. Yeah. Just won't won't give up. Tries to be in, still in the in the in the flash in the light, but in the wrong spot. You know, mm-hmm. I mean he. I, he's doing the exact same thing I was doing, being in the wrong places, running the wrong kind of cars, not going straight to rehab, which is something I should have done. Um, I, I just failed that drug test and fell off a cliff. You know what I mean? Sure. My life was not right. I didn't have, um, I didn't have exception. You know, I wouldn't accept anything. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't agree with what other people thought. And uh, just the simple fact of not being able to answer and live in reality. Mm. I wasn't, I was living the drug reality. Wow. So you, you mentioned before the show started that rehab was the only thing you never got kicked out of. Oh, yeah. What finally got you into rehab? You said you were running from it for a while. What finally got you there? <laughs> I. Uh, what got me to rehab was I woke up one morning and the sheet landed on my hand. I was like, ah, that hurt. And I looked at my hand and my hand was beat up. So I thought about it, I was like, oh yeah, I got in a fight last night. So I said, I must have broke my hand, I need to go to the hospital. So I woke my roommate up. I was like, hey, I'm going to the hospital. I'm just gonna let you know, cause it's 2007, not as many people, you know, it wasn't as, everybody didn't let everybody know through text. Sure. And um, so I go there and I tell them, man, I got in a fight, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I've probably got a broken hand. I like to get it x-rayed. No problem. And uh, so they call me back there. And the lady says, sir, you have uh, two teeth lodged in your hand. We're going to have to amputate. So I'm like, two teeth lodged, amputate. How am I ever going to race again? So that's all I ever thought about was, how am I ever going to race if I lose my hand? Right. So, and this time I'm a complete in the I'm in the dumps as a drug addict. I mean, it, it was something to where I was living at someone's house that I sold drugs to, that made it to where I was, had a living. You know what I mean? Wow. I had somewhere to live because the guy was using the drugs that I had. And that wasn't the life. So you, you get into rehab and I, looking back on the rehab, what happens in there that begins to shift your life? I, um, it was the first time I was completely honest with everybody. I, um, I, I just decided, man, it is time to go. I drove down there by myself. Uh, and check myself in. It was in Atlanta. It's called Talbot Recovery Campus. It's a great rehab. And it's not like normal rehabs to where they're 30 days. This place is ran by a neurologist, and um, they thought that it took 90 days for your brain to reset. So it was a 14 week program, which is three and a half months, um, 115 days or something. So once your brain gets reset, then they still have a couple of weeks to work on you. Um, it was in Atlanta, it had its own, it had a campus. And we lived in apartments right in Riverdale Road. I mean, you could walk out the front door and buy a crack, a hooker, heroin. Two chains, the, the artist talks Riverdale about Riverdale Road. Road. I know, that's why I said it. It's, <laughs> it's number one on this CD. Absolutely. And um, that, You like that album, Pretty yeah, Girls Like yeah, Trap Music? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I love rap. That's just what was big when I, uh, was growing up. Yeah, and, uh, same. Some I'm a big Two Chains to. fan also. Oh yeah, he's That's money. Awesome. So the rehab was such a cool place to where you didn't get drug tested every day. You got a color that you were. So you might go get tested every day. You might get tested not for a week. And that gave people opportunities to 
think, ooh, I might not get tested. Let me try a little coat. Let me try a little bit of this. Let me try. And they wanted you to fail in rehab, which is a great idea. Sure. They, they, they didn't want you to fail when you got out and didn't have someone to comfort you and speak with you and teach you things and stuff like that. It was just, um, it was a great time to learn then as opposed to, like I said, being by yourself. So it got to be, um, they, they, after the first couple of weeks, they give you a nine week program or a 14 week program. And of course, first time going, I'm like, oh, I'm nine weeks, all I need. Yeah, right. I got the 14 week program. Got it. And it's great, man. After the nine week program, uh, you become a helper. You go pick up people that are coming in. You, um, you don't just spend all day in classes. You're helping people out. You're running errands. You're, you're doing real life things with the opportunities to go buy drugs. And, and you don't do it because you do, you know, you learned. And I end up being the, um, head speaker, the DJ of graduation. Wow. And, uh, it was the first thing I'd ever completed in my life. First thing I hadn't been kicked out of. I mean, I got kicked out of hockey as a kid, baseball as a kid, um, many or hate tracks, NASCAR. Um, I went to rehab and aced it. You know Amazing. what I mean? I, and, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my whole life. And it comes to find out during that time, they start to recognize you have the bipolar disorder, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Which is really interesting. You know, I think it has a label on it that people are now starting to open up to. It's now becoming more common. They're not as scared Diagnosed of the people word. are not as, ex not as scared of it. Um, can you help us explain sort of how Shane, the drug addict, and how Shane, the non-drug, the, the healed version of himself, where they where they are similar and where they are different. Well, it was uh, it, it was a good thing that the rehab was ran by a neurologist. Yeah. So they were uh, not AA book. They, it was still ran by a twelve step program. Blah blah blah. But it wasn't all on that. They wanted to find out what was wrong with your brain. Um, I ended up being bipolar level two, which is I'm happy or I'm mad, mm -hmm. and um, I don't have as much of the depression side and the sad side. Uh, yeah, there's depression there. Who, who doesn't live in a wheelchair and have a little bit of depression? Sure. Who doesn't live every day and have a little bit of depression? Amen Just normal people, normal things. So um, the whole simple part of being bipolar let me understand that there was there could be a normal shame. Mm. You know, it wasn't just, I had found, I had found something that said, you know what, Shane, you might not be a mess up. Wow. I mean, I'd been kicked out of, I, I didn't even get to say it, every middle school, elementary school, high school, just not doing the right things because I thought that's what needed to be done. When I was 27 and went to rehab, I remember it, July, 23rd, 2007, I drove down there and checked in, and uh, that was one of the most important days I've had in my entire life, just for what I learned on the mental side of my body, because speaking earlier, I'm not gonna get there yet, but I still talk to someone today, just for the simple fact of, Great. I need things off my chest, I need things put back on my chest. Sure. Uh, reality to me takes work. Of course. So let's get to that point. You, you right. talked about new identity, right? All of a sudden, you're not feeling like you're the mess up that maybe yeah. you had once thought so, right? Yeah. Now you got this new identity, you're coming back. Can't come back to NASCAR, but you're into IndyCar now, man, and you're blazing through the comeback. I, I saw some interviews with your father. People, people are rallying behind you, they're seeing this new version, and let's go to the Terry Hawk track. Let's get to that That was moment. a uh, very fast racetrack. It was a place I'd been good at before. Uh, I'd never been there in a Silver Crown car. Um, I don't remember driving there or anything like that. I, um, it was 
October 9th, 2010. Um, this was a couple of months after winning. Uh, that, that summer, I won a lot of races. That year, I think I won seven or eight, nine races. I don't, I, I don't, even, I don't remember exactly, but uh, going to Terre Haute, I was really, really close in the points. And uh, I had been told not to race because at that time, my lower back was broke. T3 through five, um, not bad enough for me to not race, but people had told me, the doctors had told me I didn't need to. And uh, I go race and end up breaking my neck and getting paralyzed. But all, all I've been told about that day is that I went for a jog. Um, I got up super early. I went and had breakfast, coffee, stuff that I didn't do. You know, like sure. I've never went for a jog in my life and I hear that I went for a jog running through the woods random and um, I'd been working out for about three or four months hardcore before this and um, I really think a lot of that working out is what saved my life um, due to that crash because uh, my crash was pretty bad I wasn't supposed to crashed that hard. I definitely didn't need to uh, go as fast through the corner, but that's just who I was. That's what I did. I was the guy sure. that was going to go faster. You know how um, the great soccer players, great basketball players, there's times that they're going to go too far. Sure. Well, I went too far and uh, ended up hitting head first and um, Broke my neck C4 through 7, tore my carotid artery. Um, I had ARDS. I threw up in my lungs. Um, Shane, you know what's amazing is you flatlined four times in surgery. Your spirit, your resilience is unbelievable. It's a blessing to even have you that. on the stage today to be able to chat. Four different times, they, you know, you fought back to be here. It's really inspirational. And what I want to talk about now as we move into this next phase of your life is there's so much wisdom that you have that's still probably so much untapped, right? Mm -hmm. Because you go through so much more of a complex life, a new complex normal than mm -hmm. any of us, most of us ever experienced. So I want to tap into that wisdom. Okay. I want to know about, you know, what this new experience in your life in the last 10 years, decade okay. or so, what it's really taught you, right. you know? This last decade has been something to where it's been a ride. Um, good, bad, great, sad, um, happy. But I have a great family. I have great friends. Um, I have a brother, mom, and dad that do anything for me. I have aides that work for me. My mom, uh, when I broke my neck, Mm, there wasn't any good um, medical services that sent nurses and nurses aides to come help me and get me dressed and stuff like that. So my mom started her own business and uh, wow. now her and my brother are running it and um, they've got tons of clients. They won uh, Rookie of the Year the first year they put it together. Um, it's something where my, my, my brother and mom both understand that people need care you sure. know and and it, it's been something to where it's really helped me out but made a lot of experience and stuff that i needed to learn wow and, and that being how to respect people i needed to learn how to act like a normal human being and that's really hard to do when you're not a normal human being right you know i'm not <clears throat> I'm not someone that wakes up and gets out of bed and goes and pees in the morning and gets back in bed for a second, hits snooze on the thing. I uh, wake up at a certain time, my aide gets me dressed, she unhooks me from my bag, um, get me up, showers me, gets me dressed, do it all, it takes an hour and a half. Um, that's the kind of life that I live now. I really honestly can't sit here and say, 
that sucks because it doesn't. I don't know what it is, but from the day I woke up from being injured to right now, my life isn't that bad. I know wow. that when I walk into a gas station or roll into a gas station, I always say I walk, it's pretty damn funny. <laughs> um, I know I've got it better than somebody in there. You know, sure. Somebody has it worse, tougher than I do. And that helps me get through a lot of things. I really know that over the last 10 years, what I have experienced, I mean, like we talked about earlier, me and Adam, a friend, me and him fought as friends because of me, you know, because of me having a brain injury, because me just being jealous, uh, just because me not getting enough Adam time or, you know, I just needed a lot of me at that time. Sure. And um, there was times that me me wasn't all about me. You know what I mean? It needed to be for real. Perspective ch shifts. Obviously, your new world gives you a, a time to be able to do that. Let's imagine the listeners here. There's plenty of individuals listening to this story who are super touched. They might be going through some sort of turmoil internally whether it be from a mental disorder or whether they're going through a challenging time in their life or maybe they're addicted to drugs and don't know where to start. You mentioned in some of your interviews that you really want to help guide, whether it be racers or any humans really, to get back on tra track, to live life in the right way. What's the first sort of step that you would offer to some individuals to help get them from one track, racetrack in life, to maybe a more clear racetrack in life? Um, I, w I want people to understand that life is going to be different. Life is going to show you new things. Um, it, it's just like I like to, I look at now, I, I broke my neck at 30. I did everything I possibly ever wanted to do before I was 30. As a kid growing up, uh, from Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, six miles from Richard Petty's race shop, I wanted to race in Winston Cup. I didn't care that I had to win. I just wanted to race. I did it. Mm. I am 40 now. I've had 10 years to experience what this life is like. Um, I live alone. I have two dogs that I, I love amazingly. I have great aides. I have a great family. I get along with more people now than I've probably got along with in a decade. Sure. And that all comes from learning and accepting this new life. And this new life is changing things. But you have to always realize that life was going to change for me anyway. Sure. I mean, life changes for you. Life changes for everybody. And um, maybe not as drastic as mine, but you can't expect more out of people because of your injury. You have to give more to people so that you can get more in return. Wow. And that sounds weird to say, but I honestly would rather do more for people than people do more for me. Pretty, that's pretty amazing. And it's really uh, inspiring to hear you say that. And um, I know it's going to touch a lot of individuals, but I think a key thing we haven't even mentioned here is I think you're a guy that drives off a of vision. You need something that you're looking forward, you know, and you're, and you're chasing. I see some eye racing and, and all over social. I see you really running at that um, full right. speed. You're passionate about it. Talk to me about what, what the vision or what the future for Shane Mill looks like. Well, I, um, I've got the eye race. It's something that I did. Um, before I got injured, it was it's a racing simulator that um, you get to race real people all over the world. I mean, just depending on what time zone, you know, I play a lot during the day. Sure. And there'll be people from wherever, not America, so I don't know the time zone. Right, right. Now. right. But um, it, it's still to where I can race all day long and smile the whole time just because... Um, it's something that I've always wanted to do, and now I get to do it again. Mm -hmm. It's got uh, 
I had a great guy that um, built a set of remote controls that I drive with my hands. Uh, I squeeze for the throttle and I have a handbrake. And I wow. reach over with my left hand, and hit the brake <laughs> on it, slow down. A lot of times I try to race where there's no brake uh, sure. so that I don't have to use it. Um, I've got it now to where I've got virtual goggles. We race. Um, I just got a new sim rig, which is what you call it, where you stick all your computers from uh, Wheeler Racing. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't wait to show it off. I'm trying to build a social media side of where people can watch me and I feel like I can coach kids, you know, there's money to be made in iRacing. Sure. Uh, there's sponsors that want to sponsor your car to drive around. There's people that just want to have their company on your car just because they like you as a human. Wow. You know, um, I really have an opportunity to do something, not be um, someone that just sits around on their ass all day. I can actually help people i can help myself and um flat out i can race man yeah that's what I you're born to, to do that's ah it's something that i can sit there all day I, I like my brother uh i could sit and watch my brother race all day and coach him he gets pissed when i try to <laughs> coach him because i do i mean i'm like no you need to do this and do that but i have a uh, a little bit more racing laps and he does sure. I, I um i get it now to where i'm moving up you, you you have to have uh different grades of um classes so i'm up to a c class which is goes rookie d c i need to get to c on pavement because i'm c on dirt okay okay so i'm trying to build my trying to build my pavement up so the more that you move up on the rating, the more classes you get to drive. Wow. So all this thing is about is about competing. You're not playing, you're, you're not paying fake people. You're actually racing with real people. And Dale Hart Jr. is on there, Martin Truex, Kyle, Kyle Busch. There's everybody that's any good sitting on there racing. You got something you're focused on and you're building again. It gives you an, an opportunity to ride wide open, no break. Yeah. Tell me this, man. We got a lot of people tuned into this podcast who are passionate. Okay. Imagine you've got people who are uh, either in their passion and maybe have had a little bit of a leak of their passion and feel like they want to be reinvigorated or someone who's looking to find their passion. You've lived your whole life with passion overflowing you and you do what you know you're passionate about, what would you say to someone who either needs to be reinvigorated with passion or is like looking to find that passion? What would you say to them? I would say, don't give up. Mm. Um, there's too many times that I've been kicked down and got back up. Um, not patting myself on the back, just showing you that it can happen. Um, if you look at my my past, uh, kicked out of, got back in, kicked out of, got back in, went to rehab, didn't get kicked out, now I'm not needing all that stuff. Sure. But um, there's just so, there's so many opportunities for people to do what they want, and what they want is something that they might always not need, mm. but it means a ton for you to get to do what you want. And people don't stop. Keep your head down, your nose down, and do it like you love it. I mean, that's whether that it has to do with um, sadness, happiness, racing, soccer, basketball. I mean, use that as not coming from some guy who thinks he's a spokesman and stuff like that, but just know, don't give up. Work your harder than anybody else and it'll come easier. I, I truly believe that, man, is a product of how my life was built by 
That's why the saying is keep going. Shane, I'm, I'm so damn inspired by you, and I know the rest of the guys here at Wheelhouse and everyone who's tuned in yeah. to this most definitely has. If, you, if anybody would like to connect with you from this, how can they circle back around and connect with you from the show? Uh, check me out. I've got uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you can um, uh, Shane Mill, just look me up. If any uh, racers are out there, how do they find your car? Uh, just check me out. Type my name. Um, I'm looking to join teams. I'm looking to uh, make my racing career on the internet bigger and better. I, I really am, man. It's uh, something that I can't believe I get to experience every day. It's beautiful. Shane, man, thank you for coming in. It's been a pleasure, my man. Thank you, man. You are the embodiment of Keep Going, man. Thank you so much for thanks coming Thanks for on the saying show. that, and thanks for having me because uh, – Everything I've heard about this show is booming. Wow. That's no lie. It was just booming. Thanks, man. So happy to have you here, my man. Thanks.